So welcome, John Sharkey. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. Yes, my friend, Joanne Abelson, always a pleasure to talk to you as well. What are we talking about today? I think we've got to have a little chat about stretching because there's three things that I, I notice that you're doing and um, I think it's really important. One is just to talk about it. We just had a lovely webinar from you with the Fascia Hub and that was just fascinating and I know you had a massive response to that. Um, and then, you know, we take that knowledge, that understanding from the lab and we take it back to the lab, which, which we're going to be able to do in this summer. Um, in fact, isn't it, it's just a couple of weeks away, yep. isn't it? London it is. and then Italy. And then Italy, yeah. And, um, and then you're taking it in September in Dublin. You're offering a course for manual practitioners of all stripes, as I understand it, to be able to actually see where the rubber hits the road, you know, how you translate the research that we talk about, the, the dissection that we're able to actually envisage and make sense of, and then the application. What do we actually do when we're sitting in front of a client? Well, that's the key, isn't it? The key is that you have to, the key issue is that you have to be able to translate it. Yes. You know, and as I say, when when it comes to a topic such as stretching, um, I, I introduced actually at the very beginning of the presentation for Fascia Hub, I introduced a an article that had been published in the Journal of Bodywork and Movement Therapy 20 years ago. And it was uh, Dr. Leon Chader who had asked myself and Robert Schleip and several others um, to write a little uh, commentary on um, a paper that had been written at the time in the British Medical Journal. And basically it was it was saying, it, what about the, it was a review paper, um, you know, looking at the, at the research and they were basically saying that the, the evidence said that the stretching was not doing what people thought it was doing. Mm. And here we are 20 years later, and we're still having those type of conversations. Amazing. And there will always be individuals, as I say, who will have a different, a different opinion. And I've got no problem with anybody having a different opinion. What I would say is, it's just, it's a matter of, of, of discussion. It's a matter of having a conversation and um, look at the facts, and then you make up your own mind. You know, um, that's the beauty of living in a democracy, that we can all have, um, you know, a different uh, different view on things. I've frozen again, Joanne. I don't know whether... There we are. I'm are you back. back? Yeah. I'm back. So, you know, so and I, I love that. I love that idea that, you know, at the end of the day, from an educational viewpoint, um, it's important that as an educator, you know, if you're, you're standing in a room, you've got 30 students, and you're going to deliver, you know, some information to them, um, th that information needs to be accurate because they're then going to go out to their communities and then they're going to work with people who are either injured or in pain um, or they want to try to avoid injury. So you have to make sure that, you're, that the information that you're, that you're giving out is, is accurate and up to date. But like everything, people can interpret it in a certain way. So uh, the word stretch and stretching, I think they just mean so many things now to people that it's very, very hard, you know, to assume that you're talking about the same thing when two people meet and we both use that word. Because, you know, I, I was talking to um, to Yap van der Waal actually some time back. And I remember Yap van der Waal was talking about uh, Blechschmidt and he had a little quote from Blechschmidt. And I said to Yap at the time, I said, Yap, I don't believe that Blechschmidt said that. And he said to me, what do you mean you don't believe he said that, Sean? I said, well, the, the sentence that you've written, I said, it has the word stretch in it. I don't believe that Blechschmidt used the word stretch. And Yap went away and came back and said to me, you're right. He said he didn't use the word stretch. And I said, well, I said, it, it kind of made sense to me that he wouldn't have. I said, but why did you use it? Why did you put the word in there? And he said to me, and I'm paraphrasing Yap, but he more or less said, well, I was, you know, it's common parlay. I was trying to use language that people would... I was saying, yeah, but you know, the, the problem with that then is that people then would think that Blechschmidt had used the word, you know, and that it's been around all this time. But, you know, there are several countries. But it it had a different meaning in, in German, didn't it? It actually had a subtle yeah, meaning. I'm trying to think now off the top of my head what did Yap say. I think Yap said the closest that he, the, the closest that he could come to in terms of translating what Blechschmidt actually said was, I think, expand, you know, mm. expansive and expand. But the point is, anyway, yes, yeah, so the other point I was going to make is that, you know, in several countries and several languages, they don't even have the word stretch. But what does the word stretch mean? <laughs> if you go to the dictionaries that are available, I think you will get somewhere in the region of about 23 different definitions. 
Well, this is the problem because, you know, as a yoga teacher, primarily, we talk about stretching. And what we really mean is keep going beyond your limit. And then I know physiologically worse than that, we wait and we know that there's muscle creep then comes in. And then we go beyond that. And, and what happens on my bodywork table, you know, and I've really been forced to reassess what I was trained in and how to do it and try and make a different sense of what you think you're doing mm -hmm. is that I see the difficulties of laxity in the tissue. You know, I have a very dear friend who was a, a ballet dancer who her problem was she couldn't relax. She couldn't lie down because there was so much laxity in the tissue. Um, the spine didn't have sufficient stiffness for her to relax. And it's like, what? And people can't get that. And when I see people in yoga, you know, they're going for the splits. I had somebody phone me up once and say, will you take me through a training? Will you mentor me? so that I can really do the splits. I'm like, why would you want to? Yeah, why That's want not to? a movement that you do in everyday life. And I can only think that it's detrimental to the tissue and, and what a difficulty it is that we think it's a good thing when in fact, we've got the same word for when we wake up in the morning and we yawn and stretch. We know that's pandiculation technically, mm. and that's a full body reset, but that's not the same no pandiculation it's lengthening for the sake of it and just keeping on reaching beyond that tissue's limit is it it's not the same no, thing. Pa pandiculation involves you know rotations it involves a ringing of the tissues and it involves deceleration you stiffen as you go through range yeah and i know that some people have spoken to me um in the last number of months in the usa coming back to ask about ballistic movements and ballistic stretching so that's the big difference when you have controlled movements, so you're going through range, and you're, this is usually accompanied by a yawn, not always, but usually accompanied by a yawn, you are decelerating as you go through range, but you're also rotating and ringing and twisting. And I think that's a lovely thing to do. It's really, you know, squeezing tissues and, you know, squeezing fluids out so the fluids come, come back in again. There's all sorts of lovely analogies you could use and some and imagery that you could use. So that's a very, very nice thing, a very nice thing to do. But pandiculation, you go through, you, you know, you watch your little pet cat and you see the pet cat arching its back and goes through range of motion. So I don't consider that to be stretching at all. I, I think I consider that to be really lovely. And, um, you know, it's like watching a, a dancer, you know, creating beautiful lines. But the problem is when the dancer can take their leg up and take it back, back behind their head or whatever you're thinking whoa now that shows for me that shows excessive range of motion now there are people who are born with connected tissue you know pathology connected tissue problems marfan's disease or either danlos syndrome and so on so and that's not what i'm talking about that that's pathology but there are people as you said joanne who purposely want to go out of their way to be able to do to go further and further and further and you, you have to ask yourself the question at what point is it enough uh, at what point should you stop and if you are getting increased range of motion how are you managing to get that increased range of motion where is that increased range of motion coming from so you've got two aspects to it you've got your anatomical range of motion which would be osteofascial that you know the relationships um of these of what we call bones and then you've got the physiological uh, so if, in, in, in my case, my elbow here, if I was to somehow snap my elbow there, my back of my, my fingers, my knuckles would be able to continue down. There'd be, it wouldn't be my biceps or brachialis or, you know, any of these muscles that would be stopping my forearm from going further through range of motion. So what stops me going further here is the, is the osteofascial relationship. So when somebody can hyperextend, then you've got to say to yourself, well, that's, you know, where's that coming from? And that's that's an osteofascial issue there. And, and most likely you, it's ligamentous. So you've, you've now gone into the ligamentous system, which is really, you know, if we were to use one word in, a, a, to associate with ligaments, what would you use? I'd say stability. That would be the first one that would come to my mind, you know, if you're to do word associations. So... When you're when you you're kind of messing with that system, aren't you? And if you mess with the ligamentous system, well, what's the price you're going to pay? I think the price you're going to pay is lack of stability. 
Yes. And if you if you get lack, so what other words could we throw in there in terms of lack of stability? Well, maybe you know fine tuned stiffness. So therefore, the the body has to try to find stiffness from elsewhere. Yeah. So more distant parts have to become more tuned to create you know stiffness from a distance. You know, and you you place your hands on those individuals and you feel that increased tone hypertonicity in the tissues and then you, you try to what massage that out perhaps maybe when in fact now it's it's part and part it's a functional adaptation it's part and parcel of the system the system needs it yeah so now how do you fix that you know now you're left with this issue of you know this undue tension and stiffness and tightness it's just going to be part of your everyday life so but it's one thing though isn't it because you also meet people who are very stiff naturally more you know if, if we've got a scale a spectrum from fixed to flexi let's say the fixed end where we really want them to soften up a bit but they don't still need to go beyond their range of motion to this excessive intention to stretch do they they can just simply look for more gentle ways of bringing suppleness into the system and a little bit of flexibility but i think we tend to have a one size fits all approach a, a bit and that you know yoga for example is good for you so everybody should do it and the bendier you are and the more you can fold your limbs around your torso the better Never. and somehow yeah. that feels like a goal that actually can diminish um the the, the true value of yeah, how we choose yeah, you see, this is the this is the thing. First of all, in exercise science, you know, we use certain words that have specific meaning. So one of them, for instance, would be specificity. The other would be functionality or functional movement. And as you rightly said, you know, when would somebody need to do, you know, the box splits? When would you need to do and have that type of range of motion? You know, what benefit? do you derive from, from, from doing those activities? Because really what we want to be able to do is we want to be able to go through life and hopefully reach our 70s and our 80s, you know, in a manner that is um, pain-free, if, if we can get there. I think that's another story, and, and that is that, you know, the aging process for the majority of people will result in issues, whether it's arthritis or whatever the case would be, you know, hair loss, uh, gaining hair where you never had hair in the first place, you know, losing it from where you always had it, um, all of those things. It's all part of the aging process. And, and uh, what we try to do is we try our best to make decisions that uh, will, will pay dividends for us when we get a little bit older. Now, of course, from a nutrition, I'm not going to go into nutrition in any big way, by the way, I find nutrition to be such a minefield. But you stop and think about what we were told. We were told in the late 70s, coming into the early 80s, that fat was the enemy. You know, we were sold a pup in that regard. So all of a sudden we had these low fat yogurts and skim margarine and, and we're still doing it. We are still doing it, you know, and even I find myself, I often say this to, to, to when I'm teaching to people, I say I'm still institutionalized and I'm institutionalized on many different levels. You know, I use James Oshman as, as one of my um, examples because, you know, in my early days, if if my tutors had you know heard me reading James' book, they say, "What are you doing reading that book?" And they tut tut me, or they you know they finger wag. Well, because energy medicine, how dare you? Energy medicine, you say, you know, yeah. yeah, you know, and and so you kind of thought, oh wow, you know, I shouldn't be doing that. And so I was institutionalized. I was thinking, you know, if somebody asked me about it, you know, you'd, you'd be inclined to say, "Oh, that's woo woo medicine." I'd say, hang on, say, how do you know that's woo? who told you that? Well, my tutors did really. So you trusted your tutors, but as time went on. And you begin to see the explanations and the rationale and you know you begin to understand that actually there isn't just a kind of a clear cut answer that there are many areas that are unanswered and that leads to opinions that leads to people make that say well here's what i believe to be the case this happens in physics all the time from big bang theory to whatever you know you string theory multiverse and these are clever people in physics they're very intelligent individuals um, and yet there's, there's differences of opinion. So here we are now talking about this universe, the, the inner universe, and we're, we're trying to figure out, you know, what, what, what should we be doing that would be functional in life and that would pay dividends? 
So if somebody is doing something, what I would say to them is do your best to be informed. Don't, don't just do something because you were told to do it or because it happens to be part of yoga. It sounds, it sounds like we're picking on yoga. We're not picking on yoga at all. No, no, like, no. It's, it's, it's in everything. Uh, I'm picking on yoga because it's my, yeah. my discipline. But the thing is, I think also we don't understand, you know, my big thing that the body's round and the, and the maps we use and the metaphors we use are all about levers and lines and segments and parts. Mm. It drives me and you nuts. And it's like we're, we're born round. We're rounded. Everything about us is rounded. We're, we're, we're nonlinear biologic forms. There's no discussion about that. There's no argument. And I think what a lot of people perhaps don't understand is that the, the spiral nature of the tissue, the when you talked about wringing a cloth out when you're stretching, mm. the spiral nature, a spiral, let's just think of a spring, for example. You know, when a spring is too stiff, I remember when I broke one of the springs in my car, I'd gone over one of those sleeping policemen in the road and smashed and they took it out of my car and it had snapped. And of course, the entire suspension of my car went to hell in a handbasket and because this spring had snapped mm. so that spring was it was an old car it had gone rusty it had hardened it had become brittle and it had broken and it was a very very strong spring that was designed to resist compression at all yep. costs and help me drive along smoothly and, and suspend my car appropriately and then you get at the other end of the scale because this is an audio podcast you know I have to describe it you've got a slinky that you can put on the stairs and it walks that sort of walks down the stairs when its momentum gets because it's really really soggy but I think in both cases people misunderstand like for on a trampoline for example they are very very strong strings and very mm. very strong fabric that allows for full body weight to rebound on it and that's somewhere in between the car spring that got too brittle and the slinky that was too soggy. And what I think people don't understand is that is designed even in the middle of the spectrum we're describing here, that is nevertheless designed to have built-in redundancy, it's called, isn't it? That, that there is, that it can open and it can close relative to its full range. Yeah, it, it can do both. So it allows for movement. And what I With, think without people, without without lengthening, in fact, yes, without changing. There's no more material when it's pulled out straight than Absolutely. there is when it's squished, which is what throws people in the body. Mm. But the idea I think that we're talking about, if, if I'm correct me if I'm wrong, is what we're saying is don't pull on it and pull on it and pull on it and pull on it because there's that point where you get plastic deformation. And then we're all in trouble because it goes beyond physiological range and it can't come back. And that's where I think we have to find these ways of describing that there's supposed to be a range. You're supposed yeah. to be able to move, but you don't but want you to see, The, the thing is that um, elasticity refers to the ability to resist lengthening. Right. So, in yeah. fact, if you if you've got good elastic tissue, then you are good at resisting lengthening. Now, there are so many variations on the theme, Joanne. I know you know this, but for the for our listener, there are so many variations on the theme that somebody is coming to you, as you said, and maybe there is pathology in the system, so therefore they have this excessive range of motion. Now that's a connective tissue pathology and that could have implications for them in terms of cardiac tissue and so on, not just ligamentous tissue, you know, in the joints, but it could actually be what some people refer to as the heart strings, for example, you know, the chordae tendine. Um, mm -hmm. And I've frozen again on my screen, so I'm hoping you can still hear me at least. I can oh, see. Yeah. Keep yeah, doing, yeah. Yeah. Um, so as I said, we keep coming back to this, uh, this idea of if you're going to do something but you, you need to ask yourself the question, why am I doing it? What am I trying to achieve therapeutically? What am I trying to achieve? Some people say things like, well, it makes me feel good. And I say, well, that's that's fantastic. It's great that something makes you feel good. I have a friend of mine and she smokes 40 cigarettes a day and smoking makes her feel good. Um, somebody else just loves Kentucky Fried Chicken or they just love fast food because it makes them feel good. So. 
I know somebody who loves alcohol because it makes them feel good. Job. Makes them feel good. You know, I, I enjoy a glass of Chardonnay myself. It makes you feel good. But you know, I'm not. I'm not doing. I wouldn't be. You know, drinking a glass of alcohol, not knowing that there that there could be a price to pay. That then that there is a price to pay. That's what I'm saying. And if you're willing to kind of pay the price, well, then that's great. You're informed. And um, and that to me then is kind of a more a mature way of of approaching something like this, particularly if you're going to be working with children, because children are simply following what the coach is saying, and you know it's it's incumbent on the on the coaches and others to be able to understand, for example, the physiology of a child, uh, which is very different to anatomy physiology of an of an adult, and if you do something to the ligamentous system. You know, that may not be reversible. So it's a really serious responsibility. You know, so the word stretch is just the word that we're using. Um, but we need to investigate what it is that the person is, is in fact doing. I mean, remember my, my daughter Katie came home one day and said to me, Daddy, I don't want to go back to gymnastics anymore. And I said, why not, darling? And she said, oh, well, today she said they had us, you know, in a split Spitz position, and there was a girl sitting on my back pushing me to the floor. She just oh. didn't like it, but of course, this is what they want to do. You know, in in, in this particular club, they, they want to kind of force the issue and bounce and bring in momentum and ballistic action. To what purpose? Why? Well, Boring ligaments. I can just feel them from here. Bless her. Yeah, I want to go further. I want to get my chest to the floor. Why? Okay, well, because in gymnastics, you know, you get points for being able to do the movements. Okay, great. So now, now we understand what your motive is, but what price are you paying? In other words, where is the range of motion coming from? Now, if somebody can't really tell you where the range of motion is coming from, that to me is dangerous because all you're doing there is shooting and whatever you hit, you're calling at the target. You know, you have to understand that there's a limit to tissues. You know, there's a physiological anatomical limit. It's supposed to be. It's supposed to be. And they're supposed to be. Now, the other thing then is people say, oh, well, I feel tight. So that's a symptom. To me, that's just, that's a feeling that you have in the tissue. And what we're what we're seeing, in fact, is this is a an issue of, of consciousness and subconsciousness. This is a subconscious issue which is being misinterpreted by an individual. In other words, the, the body may have... Um, uh, ex some experience and feels a little bit threatened in some way. Now you might think, God, I, I don't really feel threatened. No, the way you have set up your exercise program and the things that you're doing, the feedback mechanism to the brain is misinterpreting the information and the brain is responding by giving you stiff or short and tight hamstrings or stiff and short and tight upper trapezius. And the solution is not to take those tissues and try to lengthen them. You know, you've got to ask yourself the question. Let's let's say that they are short. Okay, let's use the classical words of short and long. And now I don't believe that, just so people understand. Um, and I know that that can sound, you know, a little um, kind of academic or, you know, what do you mean? But things things it, it, overall, no one particular element shortens and no one particular element lengthens but the entire thing expands or, or shrinks expands or contracts um, and the slinky is a, re a really nice example you just pull either end of the slinky and the whole thing moves but you've got this redundancy in between the spirals that allows for that now if you took that slinky and you pull your hands apart as far as you possibly can go and then go even further you're now going to as you said joanne you're going to go into a what, what people refer, refer to as plastic deformation and then you're you're not going to get it's not going to come back, back. Yeah. never going to come back yeah so, you, so in other words it loses its spring quality it loses it? It loses that its quality. Yeah. yeah but what we need to do is we need to stop and ask ourselves the question you know what is it that we're stretching what, what, what is it that we're trying to change what are you trying to affect what's the therapy what's the therapeutic outcome going to be is it that there's some adhesions in the tissue so you want free adhesions is that what it is um, and there's different ways of looking to see if there's adhesions. Um, is it that it's a neurological shortening? In other words, that you're getting excessive tonation. You know, so you have a nervous system which is sending and receiving, you know, electrical signals, and that causes our muscle tissue and even our fascia to be able to shorten, to contract, to shrink. And um, so, why is that happening? And and why would stretching Affected. Why would stretching rectify that? 
In other words, if you, if you can come out with a rationale to say, well, here's why. But stop and think about this then for a moment. And of course, as, as you said, Joanne, we don't have visuals. This is all auditory. But, you know, your, your stomach is basically a flat uh, tube that has dilated. But it's a flat tube which has the capacity with the appropriate change of tension and compression, has the capacity to expand. So you, you take in food, you chew it, you swallow it, it goes down the esophagus, and it that's the appropriate force that then it creates a, a, an opening for the walls to move apart. Now, when there's no food in your stomach, that, that opening or space doesn't exist, it's flat. The same with your bladder. So in other words, I'm always saying to people that there are no spaces in the human body. There can be a virtual space. Um, or a potential space. A potential space where there is where there is um, potential for something to, to, to change shape. So your, your bladder, when it's empty, the walls of the bladder are, are close together. And then the potential for fluid, urine, is there to go in and push the walls apart. Yeah. Now, as you push the walls apart, you could say that you're stretching or lengthening or expanding it so there are specialized nerve uh, units that are monitoring that and as they get excited they then send information to your spinal cord which in turn goes through a loop comes back and will innervate the muscle tissue responsible for you then having to take a wee or whatever the case the same thing with digestion it's the same thing with muscle contractions in other words the human body is predicated upon resisting lengthening. That's how we move through life. You have to resist lengthening. Now, if you take tissue and you then bring it through physiological range and then bring it beyond physiological range, yeah. you are now messing, really seriously messing with that, uh, system. With, with that communication system. Yeah. So now the, the communication is, is, is going to be um, interfered with. It's not going to be happening the way it should do. And the problem with that then is that, you know, some more distant cells, some more distant body parts are, are going to have to be called upon to try to add, you know, some tension or some resistance uh, to, to the situation. This is what, what we, where we were a few minutes back. Yeah. Um, and, and this is what happens. And people say, oh, God, you know, my, my back feels, feels stiff all the time. But the problem then is, you can't, you can't in many ways get rid of that stiff back because that stiff back is a functional adaptation to the fact that you, that you need it there for, for whatever reason. So I think the, the, the way I live my life and the way you know, we teach neuromuscular therapy, and I think in neuromuscular therapy, we are very much meso, we're very much in the middle, the mm. middle ground, a little bit of everything. You know, a little bit of everything is great and there's always a price to pay for every single thing you do, but there are some things that it's worth paying the price. You know, but um, excessiveness, I think, is 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 where you're is where you're in in trouble water. So, but and and that brings us then into a conversation of sport. You see, because people love sport, and we love to go to our rugby games, and we love to cheer on, you know, our, our favorite team. And those boys and girls go out there, and boy, do they get beaten up on our behalf. And they love it as well. By the way, they get they get great joy out of that. But there's a price to pay for it. Well, it's absolutely. And I, you know, I focus the work I do on honoring that recoil and honoring that rebound and honoring the way that the body has that innate mechanism. I remember working with my dad, God bless him, years and years ago, he, he used to come to my yoga class just once a week and oh. always working into recoil and gentle rebounding and, and just honoring that I call it the five R's of myofascial magic. And, um, he I never forget one day he took my dog for a walk and he came back and he was covered in mud from head to foot and I was like dad what's happened oh my god and I he was laughing his head off I mean he was in his 80s and he was laughing his head off and I said what are you laughing at he said oh well I, I slipped over in the mud but I bounced it was fine and I've just made a bit of a mess of my coat but you know it'll go in the wash and I'm like oh my god are you all right are you all right and he said no I, I of course I'm all right I bounced and I was like really and it really was amazing how little was needed because he he did a little bit on, you know, in between and, and he would always clean his teeth in tree pose. He used to say, I always want to test my balance and stand on one leg, you know, and see how he could do well, that's it. Very, that's excellent. That's really good. By the it way, was, I'm just doing a, a paper at the moment with some 
some friends and colleagues of mine in Belgium and were showing a relationship, believe it or not, to being able to balance on one leg and longevity. So you know the way people use grip strength as a yes. test? Well, there's a correlation that if you're able to stand and balance on one leg, you live longer. <laughs> well, literally, he literally used to stand and clean his teeth standing on one leg in tree pose on one side and then the other. And, and God bless him. I mean, he was still doing it when he was 89 when he when he left us so we we that thank you for that and it's brilliant and i just wanted to share with people that the two things that are coming up well three things that are coming up the first two are both dissection there's one in london at kings um this month next week i think yeah and um there's an the other thing is the in italy which is going to be fabulous i can't literally can't bear that i'm not going to be there with you and then in September, John, tell us a little bit about what's happening in September. You're doing a course for... Yeah, so just before I do that, Joanne, real quick, well, I, I was saying um, I did a little piece to, uh, on Facebook just the other day. You know me, I'm useless at social media, but I did a little thing on Facebook. And I was really, really surprised at the interest in it. I just the thought, feedback, wow, yeah. you know, just huge interest and loads of emails from people asking me questions, particularly about the model that I used, a 3D print model that I have. And people were just fascinated by it. I was thinking, you know, sometimes I, I kind of surprise myself and I get surprised by, by what people are interested in. So I'm just let, I'm going to put a little, a little video clip. I was out for a walk with my wife the other day and we just did a little small piece to camera and um, just to say hi to everybody and to, you know, not promoting anything in particular, just simply saying I'm going to do a, a little piece to camera um, and I'm going to use the 3D uh, printed uh, anatomical model because it's a beautiful model. Um, and I'm just going to talk a little bit more about that and, and maybe describe some of the anatomy because people seem to be really mm. interested in that. And I know that I have I have issues. I, I know myself I have issues where sometimes like I wouldn't listen to me speaking for 20 minutes. You know, you know, I, 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 that's the way I think in my head. You know, why would you be listening to him for 20 minutes? But it's the anatomy aspect of it that people I think are very interested in. And I'm delighted that there is that there seems to be such an interest. And um, but then it comes back to what you said, Joanne. It's it's well and good for me to talk about Batson's plexus. But you know, what's Batson's plexus and what's it, you know, what's it got to do with anything? Um so you, you've got to be able to put it into a context mm. so that people can then make sense of it and then say, and, and is there something we can do about that in the clinical setting? Is there, you know, what what can we do? Because everything that we do has to be at the level of skin, you know, because you know you don't touch so as directly. No, you don't touch anything directly, do you? Directly. Everything's through no, no, the skin. You're, you're yeah. Working through skin, but but don't don't be fooled by anybody telling you that you can't have a marked, you know, impact. significant absolutely. effect and, and impact. Absolutely. And you need to know, put it this way here, you can damage somebody very, very easily if you don't know your anatomy. You can really, you know, cause damage to somebody. So it's incumbent on you. It's a, a big responsibility to make sure that you that you do know your anatomy. And these types of um, specimens and anatomical models are really fantastic. Of course, they're void for the most, they're void of any of any uh, fascia. But that's a necessity because when when you're in the dissection room and we see the fascia, we're never able to have a discussion about that. And particularly in relation to continuity, that's the big issue. Um, and then we can you know, we can dissect the fascia out and we can then look at the tissues that are encased, imprisoned within the within the fascia, the nerves, the blood vessels and so on, of, of which um, are of vital importance. Um, and I see also the Fascia Research Society have sent out an email to everybody asking them to join. Um, Dr. Stecco will be with me in Italy on the 21st, and I think it's on the 21st that they, were, they wanted to have a conversation about um, the definition of fascia. Uh, I want to make it very, very clear, by the way, I was having a conversation with Robert Schleip about this, and I think myself and Robert were kind of at odds a little bit. Um, I, I think I, I may have actually, he may have picked me up wrong, or I, I've picked him up wrong a little bit. I've got a paper that's going to be out shortly um, talking about fashion, the definition of fascia. But it's not that I'm proposing a definition of fascia. That's not my, my role. The International Federation of Associations of Anatomists have, they have the mandate. They are the people responsible, anatomists, they are the people responsible for all anatomical and medical nomenclature. Not someone like me, but as a clinical anatomist and others, we have a voice and, we, and that voice needs to be listened to. 
So part and parcel of that is that you produce a paper and it should be a well-constructed paper, which these people can then, if they're going to be doing their homework correctly, they will go and they will look for these papers and then they should consider them in terms of, of, of being able to come up with a definition of something. Now, they, they don't change definitions easy. You know, um, there, there would be a lot of thought would go into something like this uh, before they would ever make any, any change to the word fascia or to its definition. But, you know, there are lots of different committees. You, you could have a committee on the word contraction, you know, meaning to shrink or muscle, musculus, meaning little mice. It's ridiculous little mice under your skin we need to change that name yeah well okay and that's great and you can express that opinion but these people are the people who are responsible mm. for making that decision so i'm not responsible i'm not on the international committee and neither are other smaller committees that establish themselves but it's great that they that the conversation is taking place i think that's a really yeah. good thing that's a good thing to, to happen um so what do we say oh yeah so then when is it September? I think I've I've a workshops in, in September, which I'm really looking forward to, by the way. So it's but it's going to focus specifically on vascular insufficiencies. So, in other words, being able to provide people with the skills and knowledge to be able to assess vascularity, um, you know, pulsations. A lot of times when people have an issue in their tissue, it really centers around ischemia, either too much blood supply or too little blood supply. Right. So and that, that can lead to, for instance, people having headaches. It can lead to inflammation. And why am I still inflamed, you know, 12 weeks later or six months later? Why am I still in an inflammatory stage when, in fact, that should have only been, you know, 12 days or whatever it might it should be, depending on the, the extent of an injury. So that's basically what that's about. I think that ischemia is plays a huge role in almost every insult that a manual therapist will come across. So that's where the focus is going to be on that. And of course, it's going to be looking at uh, fascial, osteofascial techniques and fascial techniques to offer intervention. The beauty of it is we'll use ultrasound so that we'll be able to do before and after. So I think that's- That'd uh, be really exciting. And and so, and does any, can any discipline participate in that? Do well, you have absolutely, to be a... again, of course, yeah. Right. You don't have to just be, you know, a, a, a neuromusculotherapist, anybody. I mean, whatever your stripe, absolutely get involved and we'll have a we'll have a good uh, we'll have a good workshop i can't wait and i mean i'm praying i can be there it would be brilliant and i will put those details underneath the podcast and send links through to your is it john sharkey events.com com yeah great yeah yeah and uh, and we'll we'll make that happen because i just just can't get this information out there enough and thank you thank you so much for your time no it's brilliant. i love talking to you joanne you know that <laughs>